Excellent. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the Serving Country Forum. It's great to see so many enthusiastic people here. Uh, my name's Joshua Creamer, and I'll be the Master of Ceremonies this morning. Uh, the forum's part of the QNZAC celebration. So um, uh, this generation, uh, for the next five years, or part of the five-year program, uh, memories uh, for us all. Um, you've got a action-packed day today. We've got an array of speakers from all over the country who have made a significant contribution, actually, um, to the research and to the understanding of Indigenous um, participation uh, of our servicemen and women. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners. Yeah. Um, I'd like to actually acknowledge the hard work of the State Library. This event obviously just would not be possible without the team and, and their support in bringing it together. Um, and in doing that, I'd like to invite our host uh, this afternoon or today, the CEO of the State Library of Queensland, uh, Jeanette Wright, to open the forum for us. So please welcome Jeanette. Thank you very much, Joshua, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today, and particularly to welcome Joshua, because I believe he's just become a new father this week. <laughs> so, so if he gets weary after lunch, you might forgive him. <laughs> and I would too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here at uh, Kurilpa Point, the Turrbal people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. I'm uh, very appreciative to Songwoman uh, Maruchi for your welcome because it's a very special way for us to acknowledge the importance and significance of this place here at Karilpa. I want to acknowledge and welcome our keynote speaker, Dr Jackie Huggins, AM, Fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, author and Indigenous Affairs consultant and a former member of the Library Board of Queensland. And also Auntie Violet McDermott, board member in Inala Elders Association, Sherberg Elders, Uncle Eric Law, Auntie Shirley Law, Auntie Sandra Morgan, Auntie Jeanette Brown and Auntie Ada Simpson. Uh, um, and also Uncle George Bostock, community elder. I also am very impressed at the range of uh, presenters and panellists we have on the program today. Um, including some of our own staff from here at the State Library, Des Crump, for instance, who can, will be telling us stories about the work he's doing with our collections, and, um, and people uh, like Gary Oakley, who've come from the Australian War Memorial. So we have a, an exciting rain, rain, range of speakers here with us today. And I'd like to say that this program really has been... Uh, supported and uh, by the uh, Queensland Government. It was the Queensland Government that funded the QANZAC 100 Memories for a New Generation program through the State Library. This is a, a four-year program and the program was uh, proposed to the State Government as uh, a way for us to capture, preserve and make accessible the stories of Queensland during World War I. And this included uh, statewide engagement with local communities so that we uh, are providing workshops and uh, capability building with heritage leaders right across Queensland. It also uh, included uh, the opportunity for us to build a digital legacy so that where, where others were doing things in the events area and uh, others were were creating new memorials or perhaps repairing old memorials from World War I, what we wanted to do was have a legacy which would be here in the future, which was in the digital space. And as well as this, of course, we felt that there wasn't any point in us collecting and making um, accessible this information if people weren't going to use it. So there were a number of components of our program over the four years which were part of the expression of that collecting effort. And that included performances and seminars. And for example, today's forum, which grew out of uh, part of a, a collaboration and a wish to certainly to extend the impact of the Black Diggers Project as one example. And so I'm delighted today to announce um, the opening of uh, four fellowships for the uh, World War 
one uh, program uh, from the State Library. And these fellowships will be worth uh, $15,000. And uh, if you want details of the fellowships, they'll be on our website. But they will be there for uh, individuals to apply to do research around the topic of uh, World War I and the Anzac centenary. And so we'd especially like to encourage people to work in the Indigenous space uh, for that. Uh, fellowship opportunity. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, wish everyone here a, um, an enjoyable day, and I'm looking forward to meeting many of you throughout the day. So um, I'm very happy uh, for us to have the seminar here today. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, we have a few of the housekeeping matters, but before we do, uh, I just uh, I'll read through the. Obviously, there'll be a number of images and recordings today. Um, any of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander audience members uh, advise that today's proceedings will involve photo may involve photos and images of deceased persons, as well as recordings and writings um, that may cause distress. Before we start the formal side of things, there are a few housekeeping matters. Um, bathrooms are actually outside the auditorium. You may have noted them on the way in. Uh, there'll be lunch and morning tea served today in the talking circle at Kiril Dargan, but we've got staff on hand if you're not sure where that is, and, and breaks will direct you down to those places. Uh, the, as I think has already been mentioned, the event is being live streamed and recorded. So if you, haven't formed, uh, if you haven't signed a consent form on your way in, there are consent forms outside or chase one of our staff members um, and we'll be happy to assist you in completing those. Throughout the day also, um, with your phones on silent, but f uh, please feel free to tweet Facebook and Instagram about today's events. There are a number of hashtags uh, and you can see them there, QNZAC100, hashtag serving country or hashtag WW1, and if you're not sure what hashtag is, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, we, we, have a, we have a really tight time frame today, and there may, may be people who want to share their own personal stories and experiences. Um, so I encourage you to, to meet with our speakers during the breaks or meet with one of the staff uh, representatives on hand, because we do want to capture as many stories and as much information we can. Um, and so we'll try and do that uh, maybe outside of this room. But uh, uh, it's, it's important, I think, um, certainly in my notes, everybody's saying keep to the time. So I may be pushing you along a bit at some stage, but uh, please forgive me. Uh, finally, I'd like to invite our first speaker to the stage, uh, Jackie Huggins AM. Jackie is a very proud Bidra Birigaba Juru woman from Queensland. Um, she was born in Air and grew up just down the road in Nala. Jackie has filled many, many, many roles um, in her uh, continued advocacy for Indigenous people, and she's now a consultant in Indigenous Affairs. She was a board member of Council, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation from 1994 to 2000, um, and as I said, filled many other capacities. She has written two books, and I just want to add, one of those actually was introduced as evidence in the Bidra trial in the federal court. I was there, so I know that. Uh, one was a biography of her mother, uh, Auntie Rita, and Sister Girl, and as well as uh, she's done many, many journals and other articles. So please, really warm welcome for Jackie this morning. Thanks uh, very much, Josh, and um, Wudamuli to you all. Um, I've uh, entitled my paper today, All's Not Fair in Love and War. I wish to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the country, to uh, Sister Marucci, for her wonderful and uh, always elegant welcome uh, to country, to our elders, past, present and future. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank very much the organisers, my sort of own other sort of sacred space and home, I suppose, State Library of Queensland, uh, to thank um, Jeanette for having us, to the organisers, um, uh, Olivia, who first approached me, Des, um, Lara, uh, etc. You know who you are. 
Um, but also I'd like to um, uh, pay my respects to my Sherberg mob here today, which is uh, wonderful to see you all. And uh, many people would know that a lot of Brisbane people have those Sherberg roots, and I firmly hold to that principle. And uh, it's good to see Aunty Ada, see you there, um, as well, that came down from the Ration Shed and, and Sherberg, great uh, people. Um, uh, where's Pat O'Connor? I'm going to name a few of you because, Pat, you've been doing work in this space around war service and uh, service men and women, along with your other many, many uh, bits of history and the Language Centre and so forth. Great to see you. Uncle Nerd and Serico as well. Lovely to see you as well. And uh, to all other elders, if I've, I've missed you. But I would also like to pay my deepest respects to the past and present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have served, to those who served in an auxiliary capacity for the Australian Defence Forces and those who gave their lives. Many people think that Australia's military history began with the landing at Gallipoli in 1915, but it really began with the arrival of the First Fleet in 1788, more than a century before, and continued throughout the 19th century. Colonial history has developed its own military history. Not fully recognised at the time and dismissed for generations, the frontier wars between Aborigines and whites deserve a significant place in any account of Australians at war. However, for the purpose of my talk today, I am concentrating on the armed services of Australia, something that I only know too well as a descendant of war. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have served with distinction in the Australian Armed Forces across all the services, Air Force, Navy and Army. They have been visible and invisible, forced to deny and subvert their ancestry in order to serve the country they loved. As they put their lives at risk, dimmed their memories of their loved ones at home, covered themselves in the filth of the trenches and dodged the bullets, these men and women left behind some remnants of their DNA in the soil and the families back home. Some were waiting for them, some never returned, and some still yet to be born. <coughs> My name is Jackie Huggins. <coughs> and my slides should be there. <laughs> Maybe the next one. It's not happening. Okay, there it is. Okay. I'm a Bidjara and Birigaba Juru woman. And I am proudly the daughter of these two fine people here. To your left, my mother Rita Huggins, Nee Holt from Carnarvon Gorge, Springshaw area, Bidjara country, and later ensconced onto the Sherberg Aboriginal mission in the 1920s. Along with her mother and father and some of her siblings, Barney, Claire, Margaret, Harry, Thelma, Violet, Jim, and Ruby. Later on in Baramba, as Sherberg was called then, came along the young'uns, Oliver, Lawrence, Isabel, Albert, and Walter. A mighty big family, yes, but this could never be matched by the handsome man she married, my father, John Henry Huggins II, who was an only child. You see, we have 71st cousins on the Holt side and zero on the Huggins. I have often wondered how it would freak my father out having all those instant brothers and sisters when he married my mum. He would have to begin the process of sharing everything. Now, as a mother myself of an only child, I do know how they get spoiled and love their own space and dwell on their self-importance and being the centre of attention, if not the universe. <laughs> but some can actually turn out wonderful human beings, such as my grandfather, father and my son. I say this without, without uh, not one ounce of malice, but with deep conviction. From all the stories I've heard about my father, whom I lost at the age of two, from his World War II injuries, 
He was indeed a man of high degree, compassion and integrity. In fact, his best mate, a fellow digger from Ayr, whom mother and I reconnected with some 25 years ago, reaffirmed all the qualities my mother instilled in our hearts and minds every day as she spoke of him. So in a very real way, I grew up with my father. She always reminded us of how proud he would be today. A little bit more about him later. Moving on, and these two are my paternal grandparents, John Henry Huggins I and Fanny Huggins. I could not find any photographs of my father as he served, sorry, my grandfather as he served. However, if you look closely, you can see some badges and medals my grandfather is wearing. Yes, he too is a soldier, having served in World War I. As far as I can ascertain, he joined the forces quite late in life, at the age of 30. He enlisted in 1916 in Bowen and served a year overseas on the Western Front. He was injured and hospitalised twice in Belgium. Folklore has it that on the second occasion, many of his battalion were wiped out whilst he was recuperating in hospital. Thank God I say for that as I wouldn't be talking to you now. In fact, and getting off the track somewhat, but it is important to note, I love to use that, use that particular analogy about how lucky we are all as human beings even to be on the planet today. Any one of our forebears could have been poisoned, got smallpox and other irreversible diseases, been shot, died in childbirth, etc., etc. Yet we are still around to tell the story. How precious is that? And how tenuous and special is life itself? Make the most of it, I reckon, because it won't come around again. The First World War was Australia's greatest tragedy. Approximately 60,000 were killed and thousands more were wounded, maimed and physically and so, uh, psychologically scarred. Few families were untouched by the war. As Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we all have our stories to share. And every one of us in this room, I'm sure, has a descendant, uh, uh, is a descendant of the, of the people from wars. The First World War shaped Australia for generations, and the effects of war are still evident. Australia played only a relatively small part in this global conflict, yet Australia's contribution should not be discounted. This helped define Australia as a nation and established the Anzac legend. The sacrifices have resonated with Australians to the present day. Grandfather embarked on ship HMAS Seen Tune A49 on the 4th of May 1916 from Brisbane. He probably served under Brigadier General John Monash, who had commanded the 4th Brigade at Gallipoli. Grandfather was a stockman when he enlisted, like so many of our Aboriginal men. And I often think he would have loved to do his craft and ride his horses overseas. He didn't make the first light horse brigade at Gallipoli a year earlier, and surely he would never have been considered too dark, as they say, for the light horse. My work on my father and grandfather is still a work in progress, after all these years, and I am still doing research, and thanks to my good friend and uh, with the assistance of Gary Oakley from the Australian War Memorial, who you'll hear from later. It has been a dream of mine uh, one day to write my father's biography as I have done my mother's, Auntie Rita. I'm not sure that too many authors have been brave enough to do this, to write about one's own parents. I have considered doing father's book as a fiction or novel to capture all the facets of his life as I can recall, as told to me by others, without downplaying his role in the war. Of course, I have to mention here too my grandmother, of which there are a few records about her life, is always being told to us by her mother, our mother and other family and community members that she was of Maori heritage. Whether this is true or not has often pondered me. It has also puzzled me why my father's family stayed in air and remained 
free people while other Aboriginals were being herded off in droves onto missions and reserves, as my mother had. Did they claim another identity to escape? At that time in history, to be anything other than Aboriginal meant higher status, more power over their lives, and escape from the mission concentration camps. And little did I know that many years later, my father would be in an overseas concentration camp. I can now understand why Aboriginal people at that time had to survive and keep a certain amount of dignity intact. My father's family certainly would have been exceptional in their time, having quite egalitarian relationships with the local white townsfolk in air. And how proud of their military history were they? A question I have asked myself over the years, and I am sure it presents itself to many Aboriginal people who are descendants of Defence Force personnel. And the question is, why did they do it? Go fight in a senseless war when we weren't even citizens of our own country. The living conditions for Aboriginal people back home were atrocious. They were in the trenches too. Hindsight is, good, is a good thing, but for our men and women, what was it all about? Some answers have been that they got a wage, equality and adventure, free food and lodging, wearing the regalia, perhaps. Some may have even believed the rhetoric around serving and defending country. They really believed what they were doing was correct. And in my case, and in many other cases, following the footsteps of their fathers and uncles. Who knows why my grandfather and father enlisted, but somehow they seemed to be very proud of the army. And so was my mother. Now, if I may sound cynical, it's because I am. Because I did lose my father when he and I were so young, and he never got a chance to tell me why he went. However, it was, I know, deep down that it would have been a selfless act on his part. That's the man he was. I know in the case of my father and grandfather who transcended the barriers of class and race at the time, it would have been an extraordinary step for them to enlist. By all accounts, they were considered free in the sense that they were not imprisoned on missions and reserves. They lived independent lives in a small country town in North Queensland, mixing and engaging with the local townsfolk. They had some notion of equality. Their worlds were so different and in stark contrast to those being lived by the majority of their Aboriginal brothers and sisters at the time. Every year since I can remember, my mother went to the dawn service on Anzac Day in Anzac Square, Brisbane. She would get a taxi in from Manala and go back home again, which still costs a fortune. But in those days, and on a war widow's pension, she could never get any of us out of bed to go with her as it was usually too cold and too dark. Off she would wander, dressed immaculately as always, adorned in his medals and come home to tell us about it with the sadness but accomplishment in her style and in her stride. In those days, I wasn't particularly interested, really. Times change and years later, in 2012, I was appointed to the National Anzac Centenary Advisory Board, ACAB, under retired Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston as the chair. I was sitting around the table with major generals and everyone else, the only little black duck as usual, <laughs> uh, but you know, you, you go with that. Um, uh, the ACAB was asked to provide high-level strategic and independent advice to the Australian Government on the Anzac Centenary Program 2014-2018. It was as if my father was insisting I do this. It worked and I became enormously proud of him, my grandfather, and all those who have served our country. <laughs> 
In the precursor to ACAB, the National Commission on the Commemoration of the Anzac Centenary Report 2011 uh, stated that two groups were identified as having been poorly commemorated in the past. And it was thought that the 100th anniversary was an opportunity to correct this. The first being First Australians and the other Vietnam vets. Of course, we had many soldiers who were both. The report further commissioned Colmar Brunton on a range of investigative projects and topics and their research report stated that too many Indigenous Australians, for many of them Anzac Day has felt like a party that they have not been invited to. And they do not feel many of the values that the general public associate with Anzac Day, such as mateship, camaraderie, and a sense of community or connectivity. While they did not want it to become an over-apologetic reaction, a deliberate recognition of the service and sacrifice of Indigenous Australians would be seen as a, a, a sense of an, a, a gesture of goodwill one that could potentially have brought a positive impacts as well as engaging them more in the 2015 commemorations and Anzac Day and beyond. Now, back to my father's story. <clears throat> this wonderful man and my superhero, John, affectionately known as Jack Huggins, you see where I get the name from. My mother always said I should have been a boy, so mm -hmm. that's how I got Jackie, I suppose. He was a supreme athlete in his time before the war, having played first division in rugby league and would have been one of the first black lifesavers in this country. One thing for sure is that he was the first Aboriginal person to work in a post office, which is borne out by the records in Australia Post today. Take you back. As an only child, he adored his mother and father. The saddest moment of his life was when he returned to Townsville after returning from the war. He was met by his best mate, Loftus Bluey Dunn, who related the story to us many years later. As my father got off the train, weak and tired, he scanned around for his mother and wondered why she had not written to him for a few months. Bluey then told him the tragic news. She had died three months earlier. He naturally collapsed in Bluey's arms. But as if fate were to dictate, not only losing his cherished mother and his suffering in uh, captivity, in a cruel twist, two years before the war ended in 1943 and during the height of the war, he also lost his beloved father. So he came back shattered and lonely as an orphan to the family house where he grew up in air. I can just imagine what memories that house would have presented when he returned that day and night. No more laughter or retelling of stories of his experiences. His saving grace were his mates and his friends who gathered around, which made for some comfort. But how could someone get over that? After the traumatic time he had just come back from, strength and resilience are two words that spring to mind. But luckily for us, two years later, he went to Brisbane where he met our mother, not long after he married her and the rest is history. She was by then a, um, she'd received her permit to get off Sherberg Aboriginal Mission. One of the most significant differences between Second World War and the First World War was the number of Australian troops captured. Almost eight times the number captured in the First World War were captured in the Second World War. The majority of these prisoners of the Japanese. In a war where atrocities were common, the Japanese treatment of its POWs was perhaps the darkest chapter for Australia's wartime history, an experience for the nation to comprehend. Father was a prisoner of war on the Burma Thailand Railway. He was one of almost 14,792 Australian servicemen and women captured by the Japanese with the fall of Singapore. Gladly, he was not in the one third of them who would die in captivity. 
His workforce was assembled in Changi before being sent overseas to slave on the railway. 9,500 Australians worked on the railway and nearly 7,000 survived to tell the story. Japanese engineers estimated that the railway to be built through jungle and mountain would take five years to construct and require thousands of engineers. Instead, it took a year using starved and diseased POW labour. Sadly and ironically, the railway was completed in mid-October 1943, but it was never used. My blood boiled when I discovered this fact. For what? Almost as soon as it was completed, it was damaged by Allied bombing. Today, only sections of it survive. It is my hope to visit Changi um, in the next couple of years. Not surprisingly, it is not an uncommon thing that returned soldiers did not speak of the atrocities of war or what happened to them. Mother said father hated the Japs and said he had eaten a monkey to supplement the starvation diet he received of rice and water, with hardly any rations of meat or protein. I put it down to my father being at the prime of his life and his peak fitness in mind and body that he even survived. He believed in doing what was honourable and right. When father returned home, he surprisingly did not experience the type of hostility and invisibility exclusion dished out to other Aboriginal service people when they came home. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander veterans were often denied the honour and rights given to other veterans. It was not until 1967 that they were granted full Australian citizenship rights, giving them the privileges and responsibilities this carried. Father slotted back into uh, life in air reasonably well, despite the deep sadness surrounding the death of his parents. Maybe it was a small town holding down a re responsible job in the post office, post office where everyone knew the Huggins as well that did it. I don't know. He had a vast team of good footy and other schoolmates and their parents, brothers and sisters who, who took him in with their love and their friendship and their kindness, who really took care of him from what I can gather. And perhaps in a genuine way felt sorry for him without having yet a complete family. Like most men, he enjoyed a beer and was a regular at the RSL club in here and the pubs around town. He was allowed to enter the premises, in fact, and very much welcomed. Frequented uh, sporting matches, though he was by that time feeling too old to play and lacked the physical strength. He dated white women too, but as my mum says, no one could beat this little black duck. <laughs> For many Aboriginal returned soldiers, they were left out of society and were not served in shops and public places when they came home after fighting for their country. They were scorned and degraded and could not get the necessities of good life, such as employment and housing. Racism abounded in the country they loved so much and for some time and for many lost their lives and their loved ones over. <clears throat> it is no wonder they resorted to other destructive means to overcome their pain and who could blame them? Heroes one day and villains the next. I want to move on to perhaps our best known soldier and a big role model in my life personally. <clears throat> he was a true gentleman by the name of Captain Reg Saunders. Who said that after the war, his return to civilian life was not easy having been an admired and a respected officer, once out of uniform, he faced the discrimination experienced by other Indigenous Australians. Reg Saunders was the first identified Aboriginal serviceman to become an officer in the Australian Army. The first uh, son of a First World War veteran, Saunders was born in Western Victoria on the 7th of August, 1920, and brought up by his grandmother. Having attended school on and off, he found work as a sawmiller, but imagined himself going to fight in South America for the poor and oppressed with whom he felt a kinship. 
Very aware of the service of Aboriginal men fighting in the First World War, Saunders enlisted in um, 1940. After his initial training, he was sent to the Middle East as a reinforcement for the uh, 27th Battalion. Saunders served in North Africa and then in Greece and Crete. He, he experienced his first close combat and here and he was forced to uh, remain hidden by locals on the island for 12 months during the German occupation. And just recently on NITV, it showed his two daughters going back and doing a blessing ceremony at that very place. Some of you may have seen it. After escaping in 1942, Saunders returned to Australia before rejoining his battalion in New Guinea, now as a sergeant. In mid-1944, his commanding officer nominated him for officer training. He was commissioned in 1944 and returned to New Guinea. He was in New Guinea when the war ended and his return to Australia was tinged with sadness for his younger brother, Harry, who had been killed in action. He had a most distinguished career, <clears throat> both in the um, forces and in civilian life. He was one of my mentors, along with the great Charles Perkins, when I worked in the Department of Aboriginal Affairs in Canberra in the, in the mid-1980s. Amongst many things I remember him are for his stories, cigars, and the love of Captain Morgan Rum, which, of course, he really enjoyed. In fact, when I smell the aroma of cigars, I always think of him dressed up in his smart bow ties with that flashing smile. Another one of our local war heroes, Flight Sergeant Len Waters, a distinguished fighter pilot in the Second World War, flew more than 95 operational sorties. Coincidentally, I grew up with his daughters in Anala. Despite experiencing inequality in the armed services, civilian life for Waters had changed little from the inequality that he left bef before his service. In one incident, while on leave, Waters was arrested and jailed for not carrying his Aboriginal identity card. After the war, Waters returned to Australia and wrote in his diary that he was now returned to being a blackfella. And many had hoped that the contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to the Defence Forces would have advanced the movement for citizenship rights. In 1949, after pressure from Aboriginal groups and the RSL, the government amended the Commonwealth Electoral Act to give the vote to any Aboriginal people, person who had served in the Defence Forces. This is a little known piece of our history. As early as war conflict has existed on our continent, Aboriginal soldiers have been amongst it and in the thick of it. None of them, of course, were ever wars of our own making. And before the frontier wars, which I would never have had the time to get here or give you uh, that attention um, in the short space of time that I have left. From the Boer War, Korean, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, our men and women have served gallantly, both home and abroad. Between the First World Wars, there was an increasing recognition that the role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people could play in the Defence Force of Australia. That was looming. Their intimate knowledge of the land, the coastline and the waters of Northern Australia was strategically advantageous to national security. During the Second World War, when Australia came under direct threat from Japan, recognition of these cultural skills and knowledge resulted in the formation of the Torres Strait Light Infantry Battalion and the Northern Ter Territory Special uh, Reconnaissance Unit. Uh, the latter North Force was formed to utilise the traditional skills of Aboriginal people living in the north of Australia. The Yolngu members of the unit received three sticks of tobacco a week with no monetary pay. Back pay and service medals were finally awarded in 1993. Needless to say, on the 27th of February, 1958, my beloved father died at the age of 38 after a long illness from a massive stroke at the Air Base Hospital. Mama always said that he died of war injuries. <laughs> <laughs>
In those days, of course, the scourge of post-traumatic stress disorder was not unknown ailment. Today, it is recognised, and much more research is going on at present, concerning PTSD. I rejoice when I hear this, as the mental health of all ex-servicemen and women is something worth investigating before it worsens and spreads. It can kill, and all close, close relatives are affected by it in some shape or form. So my dear mother became a war widow at the age of 36 with four children to raise by herself. She moved back to Brisbane to be around the support from her extended family and kin. She never got over losing dad and never remarried. As she told us, she could never find a more wonderful man in her life to match him. Her grief was so deep and wide. She carried that with her all her life. She idealised him every day and never let us forget him. I could see the sadness and hear the quiver in her voice when she spoke of him and the war. But she had accepted long ago that that was her destiny and that was how it had to be. Legacy was a, an enormous help to my mother and father um, in, in the times that they shared together, but certainly when my father passed away. Legacy is an Australian organisation established in 1923 by ex-servicemen when one dying digger said to his mate, make sure you look after the missus and the kids. In those days, there were no scholarships for schools, but Legacy bought us parcels of food and clothing, which did not go, go astray despite me overhearing my proud mother saying we did not want to be charity cases. In fact, we were. This went on for years as we moved around, mostly in rental housing accommodation homes. They managed to track us down somehow, and I think it was our father making sure we were being taken care of. Having hated the war myself, not being particularly patriotic, nor even standing for the national anthem, but strangely enough, over the years, I've found myself defending our diggers, especially my father. And here's a story to conclude on. Many years ago, whilst I was in the midst of my Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation duties, I was asked to speak on native title and reconciliation on a panel with the then Attorney General, Matt Foley, and a pastoralist from rural Queensland who, in who incidentally walked over the Sydney Harbour Bridge with me in 2000 for reconciliation. This meeting occurred in that faraway town of Gympie. You guessed it. Well, some conservative local identities rocked up that night, including the president and the members of the gun lobby, <laughs> local farmers and about four Aboriginal people. So I knew I was in for a good night. <laughs> there were about 150 people in the audience as we proceeded to give our arguments. From memory, Foley talked about legislation, politics, the enlightened pastoralist spoke about the need for justice for Aborigines and his realisation about what native title could do, Josh, so you'd be very uh, proud of that. <laughs> um, and in fact, that it could be a good thing for, for our nation. And for me, it was typically about what we need to do to coexist uh, respectfully in, in this country. All fine topics, I thought. However, I noticed that some sections of the audience began to stir up. Maybe because it was too tame for them as we covered our topics and talked about a fair and just society. Besides, the three of us were supporting the Aboriginal cause in, sh in some shape or form. As I spoke, I could hear the hisses and the mumbles from the back room. At one point, I thought I would have been the one here dodging the bullets tonight, just like Father and Grandad did. Then came time for questions. Oh boy, oh boy, didn't it start? I sensed they would pick on me first, so I took aim as best I could, loading all the emotional ammunition that I could muster. I really felt my father was with me that night. A man sitting next to the president of the gun lobby jumped to his feet and roared, I am a return soldier and I fought a war in this country. 
I fought for a war in this country. The Japs are taking it over now, buying up our land, and your people do nothing. Ooh. When will it stop? When do we have to keep compensating you people for the land and everything like that? He was seething. I presumed he was directing his question at me as his face went red with anger as he pointed his finger directly at me. I felt my blood boil. Or gully up, as we say. The moderator of the forum came over to me and said, you don't have to answer that question, Jackie. I said to him, no, I would be quite delighted to do so. I took a couple of deep breaths as I rose and my response came out of the blue, quick and deliberate. And in, and in a very controlled voice, I said, thank you, sir, for your question. Tonight, we are here to discuss native title and reconciliation, our differences and our commonalities, to tell our stories as best we can. So please permit me to tell you mine. And this, I hope, will answer your question in some way. I come from a proud family of soldiers. My grandfather fought in World War I. My father was a prisoner of war in the Burma Thailand Railway in World War II. As an only child, my father lost both his parents while serving overseas. Both men served with pride and dignity, and I lost my father when he was 38 from his war injuries. He left my mother a widow at the age of 36. She was left to raise four young children by herself, who were just then four months, two, three, and 11 years of age. I therefore grew up along with my siblings, never having a father or a strong role model in my life. He sacrificed his life when he wasn't even a citizen of this country. That right and privilege came along much later in 1967, when I was 11 years of age. Too little, too late for my father and grandfather. So don't you tell me about fighting in the war. You could also talk about the Japanese buying up all the land. Yes, that is true, particularly along the Queensland coast here. And whilst they are our, our newest form of technological colonisers, at least they're paying for the land. <laughs> ah, thank you. Thank you. I had no notes, just came from spirit. <laughs> Relaying this to you by my notes. <laughs> by then, the man crumbled and sat back into his seat, the anger and disgust, disgust still evident on his red face. Well, firstly, you couldn't hear a pin drop, and then suddenly an eruption and standing ovation. My friends who had invited me to speak were in tears. I felt vindicated, and clearly I felt the warmth of my ancestors in the room that night, guiding and giving me strength. Matt Foley hugged me and said, where did that come from? That's the best comeback I've ever heard in all my time in politics. <laughs> that bloke's got bullet holes in his feet right now. True to form, next day in the Gympie Times, a small article appeared which stated, red, necks, red neck gets red face. <laughs> With that very quote from Matt. As I drove home that night back to Brisbane, I uncomfortably kept looking in the rear vision mirror, <laughs> a bit like Mississippi burning. <laughs> of course, uh, I did not need to worry about this as gladly the ancestors made uh, sure that I returned, um, returned safely to my, uh, to my house. Now, having said all that, I thought I was going great guns and I've just lost my conclusion. Um, look, bear with me, please. Uh, I love that story and uh, relaying it. But I do want to conclude um, with just a couple more thoughts. Where's, where are you, page 10? Sorry, I'm not normally this... People know me, I'm pretty good at this. But uh, here we go. Dad, where are you? No, that's two and three. <laughs> Josh, what did you do with it? <laughs> um, 
Ajá. How weird is that? My father is uh, saying, get off the stage, Jackie. You've it's probably said enough. <laughs> ah, here it is. So please, just two more, two more paragraphs. And I want to conclude by saying that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have served Australia in war and peacekeeping from the Boer War to the present. Their readiness to enlist beside other Australians to fight abroad for their country and for the British Empire still astounds me. Oral histories re reveal that while racism might, uh, racism might have emerged behind the lines, and I'm sure it did, when fighting on the front, when fighting on the front line, the concerns of service personnel to survive and respect one another engendered greater equality. Could it be that they wanted them to share in the freedoms they possessed? I will never know. All I know is that our country is in a much better shape. So thank you for allowing me to share my story here today. I'm sure that the rest of the day we'll hear more stories, personal stories from people. And many of us and many of them are proud descendants of war. Mine is not an atypical, an atypical story, really. There have been great Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have served with dignity and with honour. And some of them are sitting in this room tonight. George Bostock, thank you, brother, and others. I loved the play last night. Everyone, please go and see Black Diggers. It's really deadly. Um, your efforts and the efforts um, that you have all made won't be the last, but hopefully their stories, memories and contributions will never, ever again go unnoticed, lest we forget. Uh, please uh, join with me in thanking Jackie for sharing such a beautiful and rich uh, history. <laughs> we will have some question time for Jackie after our next speaker and before we break for morning tea. So if you do have any questions or any thoughts, um, please hold on to those and uh, um, we'll have 10 minutes of question times before we break. I'd like to invite our next speaker uh, to the stage. And before I do, I'll give you some information on his journey so far. Our next speaker will be Des Crump. Des's family and cultural links are from southwest Queensland, which is the top end of the Kamilaroi Nation. A very, very um, distinguished and powerful group of traditional owners. Prior to establishing Dinawan Consultancy, Des worked with a, within a range of roles uh, here with the Queensland Educational Department for a period of 21 years. Uh, those roles included primary teacher, secondary guidance officer in administration, policy and curriculum and policy and curriculum development. Des currently works for the Indigenous Languages, as the Indigenous Languages Coordinator for the State Library here and has been supporting State Library's QNZAC 100 activities, specifically uh, he has been involved in researching and supporting the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' involvement in World War I. So please welcome our next speaker, Des Crump, to the stage. Thanks so much, Josh. Let's see if we've got the... Uh Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge and uh, pay my respects to the uh, traditional custodians, the uh, terrible people, and uh, thank Marici for her warm welcome. It's uh, as the uh, Indigenous Languages Coordinator here, it's, uh, it's always refreshing to hear our languages being spoken, and particularly uh, on country. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to the uh, elders that are present here today, and particularly thank thank Jackie for uh, for sharing her uh, her story of uh, her family journeys through uh, World War 1 and World War 2 
As uh, Josh has already mentioned, um, I'll be using, uh, also using a number of photographs of um, people who have passed and um, some may cause, us, cause distress and um, the, the purpose for them is to, uh, to share their stories and um, to bring those, those hidden histories uh, back to life. Uh, Jackie showed us lots of family photos. Like most collecting institutions, the uh, State Library has a range of photographs. We don't always have the stories behind those photographs as Jack has, has shared with us. So some of these photos here are within the collection, some are from Australian War Memorial and uh, a couple of uh, community organisations as well. If only Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander soldiers were as easy to find as this fellow. <laughs> Private William Perrett uh, from Evelyn Station up on the Tablelands. This particular photograph is of the Herbert and War Memorial it's probably one of the few memorials that actually have an Id Aboriginal person identified. His name also appears on another war memorial and it has the same inscription behind it as well. And that's at Evelyn uh, Scrub where um, William was originally from. Sometimes we don't always have the stories, we have to do the research. And uh, uh, Jackie mentioned people like uh, Gary Oakley here today. Well, fortunately, the Australian War Memorial and the National Archives do have a lot of records. Another source is the, uh, the Trove and the NLA newspapers, because it would document the Aboriginal soldiers, their journeys from enlistment through to their coming home. This particular um, article here is from the, um, the Brisbane Courier on the 24th of November, uh, May 1917. Bleakley, the Chief Protector, has brought down 17 men from Barambar to fill the empty saddles. So they have the recruiting drive down George Street with the empty horses and they're in calling out to the crowd to come and take the place of these men who've died in battle. The 17 men from Baramba, without hesitation, jump on those empty horses. One of them, unfortunately, had to make the slow, long journey back to um, Baramba because he didn't have enough paperwork, but I'll tell you about that side of the story later. But it's just amazing that here's the, um, the Brisbane Courier, not only reporting about these, these men, but it had a word to the people on the um, holding up the veranda posts, the slackers as they were called. And the Queenslander went on to say the next day, those weak-kneed, spineless shirkers, veranda supports who take cowardly shelter behind the self-sacrifice of others. <coughs> so here they were unwittingly using the Aboriginal men as, um, as a way to, I guess, in, in, insult the, uh, the men, but also make them put their hands up and jump on, jump on the next empty horse that came along. The Queenslander, as well as documenting some of those, those, those stories because back then, perhaps even still today, journalism was a very honest uh, reporting of, uh, and it, it, there was no holes barred about, about emotions or anything. But one of the things that Queenslander did and, and with the State Library were actually digitising uh, some of these original photographs. They would have a list of the, the recruitments for each month. And this particular slide here you can see several of um, the men. Some of these were from Baramba. <coughs> All of them enlisted in um, 1917, and I'll tell you about why 1917 is such an important date later. All of those men in the photograph there, so we have Jim Fisher from uh, Baramba, um, Christy Hill, all of them their service was limited to the, uh, the training depot down here at Inogra. They were sent back to Baramba and their communities because they were too, too Aboriginal. Or on the attestation form, it's made a note to say they were irregularly enlisted, insufficient European parentage. And that's another important thing that, that comes into the enlistment of these Aboriginal soldiers, the, the hows and the whys. First of all, they're not even counted as citizens, and yet here they are, they're being measured by their European parentage to decide whether they're a suitable soldier to send off to battle. They're also under the Protection Act. Jackie touched on that as well. 
no longer citizens. Their lives are controlled by the chief protector. The chief protector, he was quite happy to volunteer those 17 men from Barambra and, and arrange for them to come down to, uh, to the recruiting rally. No identity, no citizenship in their own country, and yet they still enlist. Jackie posed the question, why? Why did they enlist? Was it that loyalty, that sense of patriotism? Was it, as Jackie said, the uh, free food and lodgings, that chance for travel? I guess we'll never know. They're, that's part of that untold story of these Aboriginal soldiers, these Torres Strait Islander soldiers who went away. Because whilst the war was on, on the other side of the world, that senseless war, we still had the Protection Act. All the racism, all the controls, all the restrictions on Aboriginal people still existed. It didn't, they weren't put on cessation whilst the war was on. But there were some recognition. There was some welcome home for these men and when they returned from war. This particular article here, I mentioned Trove. Well, this probably gives you an indication as why why it's called Trove. It's an Aboriginal welcome home from uh, September 1919 for two Aboriginal soldiers at the Yorubar Aboriginal Station, which is uh, also known as Old Tumala, just over the um, the Queensland border into New South Wales. It talks about Charles Turner Bird, or Charlie Bird, as he was known, and a George Bennett. And what a welcome! The proceedings started off with an old tribal feast followed by a program of songs, recitations, speeches, step dancing. Charlie Bird is my great, great uncle. He enlisted 1916 at a time when Aboriginal people weren't encouraged and certainly weren't, weren't allowed to enlist. Same as George Bennett and another Aboriginal man from uh, Yoruba Mission as well. Jacob Armstrong is my grandmother's cousin. He sang a song, same as King Bungo. King Bungo, his grandson, Jack Stacey, was the other member of, this, of the three that went in 1916. Jack Stacey joined the uh, Fifth Light Horse, uh, but at the end of 1918 uh, in Sinai and the, um, the Middle East, he came down with malaria and had to be sent home. So he didn't get the same welcome home as the, um, the other people here the other two, because when he arrived in March 1919, there was an epidemic or a pandemic called the Spanish flu because that was an unwelcome visitor that came back with the soldiers from the, uh, the First World War. And it had a particularly bad effect on the, um, on the Aboriginal communities, 14 to 15,000 across Australia in that first part of 1919. At Yorubar, 54 Aboriginal men, women and children died, including a couple of members from Jacob Armstrong's family. Um, my two great uncles died within a day of each other. So there was no time for any welcome home for those soldiers or for that, uh, for Jack Stacey. Grace Waters, also known as Grace Bennett, daughter of one of the returned soldiers, she sang a very patriotic song as well. That Waters name is familiar because five years later she had a son at an indie gully called Len, who, as Jackie told us, went on to become Flight Sergeant uh, Len Waters and Black Magic in the Second World War. So all of those stories, just from that one little article. So that's why, they, I think that's why they call it Trove. But I'll go back a couple of steps. I mentioned the uh, Defence Act because 1909, the specific exemption there, Part B, or Clause B, if you're not of substantially of European origin or descent, you weren't able to, you were exempt from uh, enlisting. The other part of it there talks about the medical authorities because sometimes on these, on the attestation forms, the enlistment forms, under the medical forms, it would have that statement, half caste, part Aboriginal, insufficient European parentage. Because the other instructions given to the recruiting officers was that if they were people, Aboriginal people, who were brought up predominantly with white people or lived or worked with them, it was up to the discretion of the enlistment officer. So sometimes our Aboriginal soldiers would make, make it past the first stage of the recruiting process and volunteer, 
But then the next stage with the medical checks and everything and the, and the determination of the, um, how much Aboriginal parentage and European parentage there was, sometimes they got knocked back at that stage. Yet we still had, had people who enlisted before 1917, because in 1917 there was a change to the military orders where after all the heavy losses in France, Australia needed soldiers. So they opened it up, if an Aboriginal person had one parent of European descent, they could enlist. So in that order came through in April. From May, June onwards, we had all these Aboriginal men enlisting, including a group known as the 20th Reinforcement for the 11th Light Horse. Sometimes they were known as the Black Watch. There's 20, 26 names there on the, uh, on the nominal roll, clean the next page, all Aboriginal. All but two of the reinforcements for that 20th reinforcement were Aboriginal. Most of them were stockmen, because they needed, they needed men who could handle horses, ride horses, could look after themselves. So they went looking Western Queensland, Western New South Wales. So some of those names may look familiar there, Frank Fisher, one of the boys from Barambar. Uh, Jack Kearns from uh, out my way, he enlisted at Charleville uh, up in Bidjara country, but he was actually from Durrambandi, where my family's from. Frank Morris from Nebo. Harry Murray from Mitchell. There were eight Gungri men from Mitchell who enlisted in the 20th reinforcement. We have the history of the 11th Light Horse here in the State Library, the official history of the uh, 11th Light Horse. There's 28 Aboriginal men in the 11th Light Horse, counting the 26 uh, from the, that reinforcement group. Not one of them are mentioned in that. There's no mention of Frank Fisher and the other boys from Baramba. No mention of Harry Doyle from Gordon Vale. Lay in an unmarked grave up in Cairns for a number of years before his friends and family I guess did enough fundraising to, uh, to provide a, a, a headstone for him. No mention of these two men. Very famous photograph, you may have seen that on, on some of the, um, the promotional material around the State Library for the QANZEC 100. The two men there, one, we've got Jim Ling Woodock, uh, he's from um, Jinjin, and John Geary from um, Bundaberg. They married over at the um, the church, which is now the Pancake Manor in Charlotte Street. <laughs> Beautiful photo, taken in um, on the 21st of July, 1917. After a week of the honeymoon, they were sent down. To, they got married before they went off to the training down in Sydney, and then later joined the um, 11th Light Horse over in uh, Palestine. So there's no mention of any of these men. We've got some stories behind the photographs. Local man here, Richard Martin from, um, from Stradbroke Island, Dunwich originally. It was interesting, Jackie mentioned the, uh, the Maori heritage and how some of our, our ancestors would claim the Maori heritage to do anything to get away from the Protection Act. My family out west, my ancestor Charles Turner Bird, born in Gundawindi or outside Gundawindi on a property, but when the Protection Act came in, the family thought it might be safer over the border in New South Wales. Another way was to claim Maori heritage. So Richard Martin, from Dunwich, went to the enlistment office in Brisbane, born in Dunedin, and not only born in Dunedin, he'd also did some time there with the light horse. So Richard Martin was just the sort of recruit that the Australian Infantry Forces needed. He landed at Gallipoli. 38 Aboriginal men are known to have landed at Gallipoli. Five of them buried there. Private Martin survived Gallipoli, only to die on the Western Front. The belongings and his war medals were returned to the next of kin, his mother down at Southport. At that point in time, they realised Private Richard Martin is not Maori. So here's all this toing and froing in the, uh, the archive records, the letters and the correspondence between the Defence Department 
and the chief protector because under the Protection Act, all Aboriginal people are wards of the state. So they had to make a decision whether Richard Martin's mother was the right person for those belongings to be returned to. They're part of the stories that we don't know. We, we don't see those stories written down. It's only people like Gary and the Australian War Memorial and their research and the National Archives and other researchers, David Hugginson, Philippa Scarlett, uh, Rob Pratt, that have, have undertaken all that work to identify these soldiers. Private Maitland Madge from Cooktown. Aboriginal mum uh, from uh, a Googie Yimitha woman. Uh, white father. Maitland Madge is, um, I guess, a very unique man. At the age of nine, he was, his father applied for exemption under the Protection Act. At the age of 18, he enlisted in the war. He's the first known recipient of a war medal from, a, from an Aboriginal background. His, his actions on the field, the, um, the uh, regiment that he was with was pinned down by fire and they were, the artillery was trying to get a, a bearing on the, um, on the machine gun nests and the, um, the enemy. Um, so Maitland Madge took it upon himself, using some of those traditional bush skills from, um, from up north, to call out un across open no man's land, take notes about where all the positions were and bring it back to, the, um, back to his, his uh, commanding officer so that they could radio the artillery to say where the, um, where the uh, machine gun nests were. And that, that turned the battle. This photo here is actually from the Second World War, because like so many of our men, after the First World War, the ones that came back, they, they were prepared to, to volunteer again for the Second World War. And unfortunately, um, Maitland um, was a prisoner of war as well, and um, died, uh, died in a um, uh, prison camp there. We also have the official history of Australia in the First World War. Um, quite a huge volume of, um, of work by C.E.W. Bean. There's only one Aboriginal soldier mentioned. There's estimated to be 1,200 to, and I think, I think we're up to nearly 1,300, possibly more, <laughs> men that, that enlisted. At least 96 we know of died in the war. 12 medal recipients Yet C.W.E.W. Bean could only find one Aboriginal soldier worthy of mention. That's uh, Private William Irwin, who received the Distinguished Conduct Medal. So no mention of all the others, no record of their stories. That's why today is so important that we've, we're uncovering the stories that, that haven't been told. We've heard about the ones who've come later, Reg Saunders and, and Len Waters. There's a lot more, lot more known about those soldiers from the Second World War, but what, what about the other stories. What about these unfamiliar faces? Sometimes we just have photographs. This one's from the Australian War Memorial. Fortunately, we have a name for this one. This is um, Private C.G. Martin from Gimbungi. We don't have a name for this one. This one's um, 9th Battalion training at um, Anogra. Even though they weren't allowed to enlist, what we find is the Aboriginal men were generally put front and centre in a lot of these photographs. Sometimes they had had a piano accordion, a drum or something to draw attention. We know some people, Trooper Will Allen from 11th Light Horse. This is a photo taken from the, um, the digitised Queenslander. Uh, Private Alfred John Blackman, one of the three Blackman brothers that enlisted from Baramba. Private E.S. Smith, another photograph from the Queenslander in 1916. So despite all those restrictions, we still had men volunteering for enlistment before 1917. <coughs> Private Harry Murray, another one from the 11th Light Horse, um, 
Private Murray was at uh, Tarim Mission, which later closed down and they were sent over to Wari. Private George Foster, another Gungri man. Like I said, eight men from, from Mitchell area enlisted at, at that same time. So today is about how do we uncover those hidden histories? How do we identify all those men from our communities, our towns? How do we document that hidden history, that unwritten history, that the stories that aren't in the official records about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participation in the war? Those untold stories, how do we tell all of those stories? We'll hear, hear later today from, from others in the audience about how they, they're telling the stories, whether it's through the Black Diggers play, uh, through Yugan Bear Museum and their war memorial, when, which they started acknowledging Aboriginal soldiers long before the idea of black diggers came along. We'll hear from the Ration Shed and, and how they're documenting the 29 boys from Barambar. How do we tell all of those stories? Yet, as Jackie said, how do we keep that dignity about, about those men, particularly those that were sent home for being too Aboriginal? And then we also have to acknowledge and, re and pay respect to the bravery of those who gave, their, who gave their lives in battle. All of those stories, they're the, the things that today is all about, finding those stories. And that's where the audience participation part comes in. Whilst we have a number of organisations, Australian War Memorial and um, Ration Shed, State Library and so on, collecting these stories, we know there's lots of stories out there from your communities, from your towns, from your families. They're the stories that we want to hear about today. Thank you, Des. And Des will be a part of our panel, another panel this afternoon, um, which will uh, w uh, spend some time talking to the, to the audience and answering your questions. Before we break for morning tea, we've got about uh, two, uh, time for two or three questions with Jackie. So I'd just invite Jackie to come up to the, grab a seat, and I might actually grab a seat myself. So now's really time for the questions from the floor, and. Um, I'd invite uh, anyone who has a, has a question for Jackie, and we've got some microphones there. So uh, we've got a question out the back. I'll just, um, uh, there's one there and one out the back. So I'll just invite you to go first, please, um, sir. Hello, Jackie. Um, thank Hello. you for your speech this morning. It was most enjoyable and informative. Um, I just, uh, I'm interested in, uh, you made very small mention about special rights, I took it, I didn't quite catch it all, but I think you meant special voting rights for Aboriginal servicemen at one time, yeah. before before the Aboriginals, you know, became uh, citizens, so to speak. Yes, well, uh, the um, the RSL, as I, as I believe, were outraged to know that our men, um, especially in World War II, in fact, went over to serve and could not even vote in their own country because they weren't citizens. So they took up the, uh, the charge for them to, um, I think it was about 1949, um, and an act was passed to say that uh, uh, Aboriginal men and women who had served in the wars, in uh, World War I and World War II, uh, would be able to, to vote. And there were also other obscure pieces of legislation around the entitlement of Aboriginal people to vote. Um, in fact, if you owned land, you could actually uh, become a voting member of the, of, of the public, you know? If, um, uh, and, and as you see, you know, most of the Aboriginal uh, men who enlisted had to prove if you had one white parent you could also uh, be given rights to vote. Very obscure pieces of legislation and um, ways in which you know we don't know that much about. Because people think that in 1967 uh, we got the right to vote. Not true. Not true. You know there were voting rights before that. In 1897 in South Australia, 
Aboriginal women could vote alongside with uh, non-Aboriginal women, but most of them were illiterate or on missions and reserves. How could they have that power to actually achieve the full, you know, uh, voting rights? So little bits and pieces um, around the voting rights were there, but you really have to dig for it to find out where that was, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you and was there a question from here, over the side? Oh, there's another question out the back, that's fine. Uh, yes, uh, this is for Jackie. Thank you very much again. Uh, but it's often said, uh, mention of um, Aboriginal men and women who served. So I'm just wondering whether there are stories of Aboriginal women who, um, who served, uh, did, they, did they go overseas? Were they, and what kind of roles did they play? Well, First World War, good one. Now, although, Gary, was it you telling me? One. There was one Aboriginal woman who went overseas. She fought in the Canadian Army. She wanted to do nursing, so she went to Might get there a microphone go. for Mike, you. Mike, to you. This is a really interesting story because... Uh, We've There's got one. one Indigenous woman um, who served in the First World War that we know of. She wanted to do nursing, so she moved to America to do nursing. And she married a Canadian. And when the war broke out, she joined the Canadian um, Medical Corps. She served in the Canadian Army, not the Australian Army. It's not unusual because we've got one for the Gulf War, the, uh, Afghanistan, and Indigenous Australian women in the American Army. So if you can't do it here, you go somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we always adapted, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. There is another lady. There is a photograph that we hold the war memorial of a military hospital in Sydney, and there's an Indigenous woman in it, and she's a nurse's aide. But all we know the name is Black Mary. So oh, yeah. there's a possibility of another one as well. Yeah. And of course, in Second World War, um, uh, Kath Walker, Ujuru, Nunakal, and her service, and other uh, other women. Um, uh, there were women in the land army, you know, who were very much part of the struggle and part of the war business who... Uh, and actually they're the stories that are even more hidden, I think, in terms of um, bringing them out. And it'd be fantastic for some of the descendants and people who know about their, their ancestors to bring them into light. But yes, but predominantly, of course, World War One was about men and about the fight. Um, World War Two opened up a little bit more and, of course, now... Iraq and um, Afghanistan, you see a number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women serving in there. Particularly, uh, there's a very strong group from the Torres Strait Islands and uh, that's another one, that's another piece of history that needs to be explored a lot more. Um, one more, qu I'm getting the sort of wrap up signal, so we might, uh, <laughs> we might uh, finish now, but I invite you, we're going to have some morning tea, I invite you to speak to Jackie during the break or um, we'll have a, a number of different panel sessions throughout the day. So please thank Jackie for her presentation this morning. <laughs>